Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session on folk life in ethnomusicology. We have three wonderful papers um, during this session, and we have a whole crew of very distinguished and knowledgeable speakers. So I think you'll really enjoy um, the music and the presentations. Um, our first speaker is going to be Douglas Dowling Peach, and he is a PhD graduate student in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology here at Indiana University. His research focuses on Gullah Geechee music in South or in coastal South Carolina concerning issues of tourism, festival, and identity. He was formerly the South Carolina Folklife and Traditional Arts Program Director at McKissick Museum and the South Carolina Arts Commission. He will be introducing um, the other speakers in the presentation, and their topic is Ola Bell Reed and Southern Mountain Music on the Mason-Dixon Line. Doug. Thank you, Louise, and hello to everybody. We're really happy to be here. Today, we're going to discuss the book and two CD set that you see on the screen called Ola Bell Reed and Southern Mountain Music on the Mason-Dixon Line. This project was published by Dust to Digital Records, and it was written by Henry Glassy, Clifford Murphy, who now works in the National Endowment for the Arts, and myself. The project traces a migration of musicians from the Southern Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina Tennessee, and Virginia to another tri-state area, that of Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. And this migration took place uh, beginning with the Great Depression and lasted throughout the 1950s. The first part of this project centers on the woman you see on the screen, and that's Ola Bell Reed, and you'll be hearing a lot about her today. The second half of this project focuses on the third and second generation of musicians whose families participated in this migration. What I'd like to emphasize is that this production has been a collaborative effort. The record collectors and archivists in the room today will be interested that this project was created in conjunction with the Archives of Traditional Music at Indiana University, the Archives of the Maryland State Arts Council, the aforementioned Dust to Digital Records, and a number of folklorists and ethnomusicologists. We're affectionately referring to this bunch of people as Team Olabel. We're really excited today to have many members of Team Olabel here to talk to you about Olabel Reed, share about her life, about her music, and the migration in which she participated. Today's talk is going to begin with Henry Glassy. Henry is a college professor emeritus of folklore right here at Indiana University, who will be introducing us to Olabel Reed. Next, Nathan Gibson, a PhD candidate in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology, also here at IU, will share about Ola Bell's career prior to 1966. Following Nate's lead, I'll play some recordings from the first disc of Ola Bell Reed and Southern Mountain Music on the Mason-Dixon Line. And then finally, we'll end today with Alan Burdett, who's the director of the Archives of Traditional Music. And Alan will be sharing about the ATM's role in this project, and also about how this fits into the larger initiatives that are occurring across campus. And before I introduce Henry, I want to recognize another member of Team Olabel who hasn't been recognized yet, and that's Jenny Williams. Jenny, will you raise your hand? Jenny was an intern at the Maryland State Arts Council and helped edit this project, and I just want to thank Jenny for helping to make this project a reality. So thank you, Jenny. So without further ado, I'd like us to get to know Olabel Reed, and to do that, I'd like to ask Henry to come to the podium. Is this working? Ola Bell Reed was born in the high mountains, the Blue Ridge of North Carolina in 1916, <clears throat> right here on the North Fork of New River in Ash County, North Carolina. She was born right in the middle of the 13 children of Arthur and Ella Mae Campbell. Arthur was a great fiddler, noted banjo picker who played with the great G.B. Grayson in medicine shows. Arthur also was a school teacher. Having a lot of children, he then became a grocery store manager 
The grocery store, of course, went bankrupt during the Great Depression. In 1933, the entire family moved north to find work right along the Mason-Dixon line in Maryland and Pennsylvania. Olabel found work as a domestic servant. She killed the terror of homesickness by singing in a band, the North Carolina Ridge Runners. It was put together by Shorty Woods and Slick Miller, both of whom had been born in Ash County just as Olabel was. They were first cousins. They put together a band, and right after the Second World War, when Olabel was the lead singer in the band, they added a young cousin, another first cousin, who was also born in Ash County, North Carolina, called Johnny Miller. And Olabel brought in her younger brother, Alex. Alex had just gotten back from service in the Second World War. While they were still performing the North Carolina Ridge Runners, where Olabel made her very first recordings, they set up their own band called the New River Boys and Girls, named after the place of their birth right on New River in the far northwestern corner of North Carolina. They broadcast first over WASA, then WCOG. Then, after that, they performed and performed constantly in public per performance areas, New River Ranch, and then Sunset Park. They also recorded at this time for Star Day. So they were professional musicians, and their normal op operation was to perform during the summers in a public place, New River Ranch or Sunset Park, and during the winters, they performed in Campbell's Corner, the big grocery store that they owned that served the Appalachian community that lived in that part of North, uh, that part of Pennsylvania and Maryland. This picture was taken in February 1966. I took it. I'd been listening to the radio, and I found a broadcast that came from WCOJ, the voice of Chester County. And immediately, I went down to that place, found Ola Bell performing. This picture that I took 51 years ago shows Olabel performing for the very first time in her life her own composition, You Led Me to the Wrong. The band includes Sonny Miller, who is a younger brother of Johnny Miller, all of them born in Ash County, North Carolina. Also, Burl Kil Kilby, who was born eight miles west into Tennessee. But all of these are Appalachian performers. You see Olabel here with Alex. This is the time that we met Olabel and I. During the next 18 months, Olabel and I recorded her entire repertory, many songs over and over and over again. I also recorded her entire life history, thinking this would be a, a celebration and commemoration of her existence, but furthermore, it would help her forward on her own career. Up to this point, she'd recorded with two important country bands, the Ridge Runners and then the, Bo the New River Boys and Girls. But what she really wanted was to go solo, it happened that during the same period, that is 1966 and 67, I became the first uh, state folklorist in the United States, the state folklorist of Pennsylvania. And one of the main things that I did was to help Olabel set herself on that solo career that would lead her by 1986 to a National Heritage Fellowship. That is, it was a very successful career. The tapes that I made at that time recorded Olabel at her high point. They were far better musically than the recordings that she later would make with Rounder. I caught her at her high point, but there was no record made of those tapes, but instead I put them, some of them in the Library of Congress, and now all of them are here in the Archive of Traditional Music at Indiana University. So Ola Bell is, though dead in 2002, quite alive on tape. Fortunately, I had good machinery. Fortunately, it was reel-to-reel -reel tape that doesn't decay. And 50 years after those recordings were made, we were able to get together, Cliff Murphy, Doug Peach, and myself, and put together this two CD set. That's a sketch of the background of Ola Bell Reed, and now it's my great honor to introduce to you Nate Gibson, the renowned author of the great book, The Star Day Story. Uh, so I've been asked to sort of contextualize some of Ola Bell's music career and recordings prior to her meeting Henry Glassy and making the recordings that you just heard about. And towards the end of the 1940s, Ola Bell had made a couple records with the North Carolina Ridge Runners, which was her first band. And despite actively playing throughout the 1950s on radio and at live shows as the backing band 
Um, she made no commercial recordings throughout the 1950s during the so-called golden age of country music. And thus, uh, she maintained a status as a popular regional attraction along with the New River Boys and Girls, but seldom was heard beyond the call letters, uh, regional call letters. Uh, interestingly though, those early recordings credited her as Ola Bell, one line above the North Carolina Ridge Runners, as seen here covering Grandpa Jones' classic bluegrass standard. After this, she would take a backseat billing to her brother, Alex, often appearing as Alex Campbell and Ola Bell and the New River Boys, which was later changed to New River Boys and Girls, which later became New River Gang. While the mid to late 50s marked a time when many women in country music were stepping out from the traditional girl singer role and taking a more individualized role in the industry, uh, a la Kitty Wells or Patsy Cline or Rose Maddox or Molly O'Day, Jean Shepard, Betty Amos and others, uh, Ola Bell seemed content to play second fiddle to the old guitar uh, for a variety of reasons which are detailed in the book. But even with radio shows and a strong reputation as the house band for Sunset Park, uh, the New River Gang had no records in the 1950s. So in 1960, Ola Bell and her brother Alex, along with Deacon Brumfield and the band, went to Washington, D.C. and recorded two songs, one instrumental featuring Deacon, and they were released on the Blue Ridge Records label out of North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. I just recently found out that there are two Blue Ridge Record labels. This is the Drusilla Adams North Carolina label. Uh, in the early part of 1962, realizing the potential that records offered and realizing the potential for them to sell them out of their own Cabell's Corner store and keep the money for themselves, Alex formed his own record label called New River Records. You can note the Oxford, Pennsylvania address on the label. And in total, they released 10 singles and eight EPs all on this label, all but one by Alex Campbell and Olabel and the New River Boys and almost all of them released in 1962 alone. Uh, later that year, the same recordings that are on these records scattered throughout were released to Starday Records, which is where my interest in the project came in. Uh, the largest independent country music record label of the 1960s and essentially a Nashville-based anti-Nashville label that was proud of being in Nashville. The musical heart of America uh, eight of the New River 45s were compiled to make their first Starday LP, titled Alex Campbell and the New River Boys. Uh, note that Ola Bell's name is entirely left out of the official LP title uh, at the bottom there. Well, I can see it on my screen, I don't know if you can. Uh, and while they may not have called themselves a bluegrass band at the time that they made these recordings, uh, Alex, for example, on the back of one of those New River EPs, called the band a, quote, group featuring the old-time original country-style music, end quote. Uh, most casual listeners, when they heard this music and they heard the banjo, uh, they called it bluegrass, and bluegrass is the reason that they most certainly ended up on Starday, as their music was sold at labeled as bluegrass music and coincided with the concurrent bluegrass and folk music boom. Uh, playing in the mountain bluegrass style, quote, the group was billed as a bluegrass act on their two solo LPs and appear on the Starday compilation Bluegrass Spectacular, as well as more Bluegrass Vol Hall of Fame, Volume 2. They were featured on the Gospel Hall of Fame, Preach and Pray and Sing and Gospel Revival Every Night LPs, uh, though they were not considered big enough stars to merit mention on either cover. Starday became quite known for their lavishly colored compilation LPs. They even put out a large number of women of country music themed LPs, but not once was Ola Bell <laughs> featured on any of them. Uh, as Dave Reed notes in Henry's text, uh, none of the headliners from Nashville, quote, none of the bluegrass masters to whom she and Alex had given work, none of them, with the two noted exceptions, had recognized her, had appreciated her skills or her songs, end quote. Uh, in essence, this is because Ola Bell and the rest of her band were perceived as, though those are the LPs that they were on that they were not mentioned on. Uh, in essence, this is because she and the rest of the band were perceived as Tex nobodies. And to some of the Starday personnel that I interviewed uh, during my Starday research, Tex nobody was a common term and a common phrase that a lot of people knew. Uh, and it's just the pejorative term that you use for an artist who wants to come to Nashville 
they could be a regional star from anywhere. It doesn't have to be Texas, but if they want to pay for their own chance to make a recording and get a record released, they're Tex nobodies. Um, and so those, it was typically used for people who came to Nashville, paid for their own sessions, and then those sessions would be released not on Starday, but on Starday's subsidiary label called Nashville. And those Nashville label included releases by Ted Lundy and the Southern Mountain Boys, as well as Jay Johnson and Earl Taylor, who uh, Dick Spotswood and I were talking about earlier at lunch, um, who were mentioned in this book as well. And this is not to say that the music on this label is not great, it's fantastic. Uh, Alex, Be Alex Campbell and Ola Bell only had one single released on Star Day, and it was relegated to this budget text nobody label as well. And uh, it, this particular song uh, that I'm going to play for you is the only song that Ola Bell recorded for Star Day, and then once again later covered for Henry when Henry was making his recordings. So this is their Star Day version of Uncloudy Day. <laughs> Pierce loved bluegrass and essentially released almost any bluegrass record he could get his hands on throughout the late 1950s and 1960s, amassing the largest independent bluegrass record label at the time. By 1966, he could not sell bluegrass. According to Pierce, in a letter he wrote to Bluegrass Unlimited in 1967, for a while, quote, for a while I felt that the college trade and the more sophisticated city trade would create a boom for bluegrass music sales, but it sure didn't happen that way for us. The people that bought bluegrass by mail order seemed to identify bluegrass with so-called beatniks, draft dodgers, civil rights demonstrators, and the like, including subversives, homosexuals, pill and dope takers, and as a result, bluegrass sales to the country music market took one hell of a beating, end quote. And in the late 1960s, there was indeed a monumental shift in the audience for Ola Bell's music. Don Pierce was certain that it was adults, broadly, but conservative, rural, adult bluegrass fans, to be more specific. And he was certain that kids would never buy it. But by 1966, everything had changed. It was now, as Dave Reed called them, the, quote, hippies who were most into her music. The college crowd, the youth, the folk scene. Henry Glassy knew it. But he not only knew it, he was in a strategic position that allowed Ola Bell to reach that audience and redefine her career. This book and these recordings and interactions with Ola Bell capture one of the truly great American musicians at just the precise moment that this realization was being made. Don Pierce's reaction to the whole phenomena of the bluegrass and folk revival was to sell Starday records and get out of the music industry altogether. And Henry Glassie did the opposite. He was onto something spectacular in this book with its great insights from Doug Peach and the connections to very real, living, lasting tradition of the New River Boys and Girls and Southern Mountain Music by Cliff Murphy, as well as Ola Bell's own voice and contributions are vibrant and vivid examples of the extraordinary kinds of collaborative work that were being done in the 1960s, but more importantly, are still being done by folklorists today. Thanks. Doug Beach. Come on back. So Nate has just shared with you a little bit about Ola Bell's career prior to 1966. And what I'd like to do is to pick up where he left off 
and I'd like to play three recordings from the first disc of Ola Bill Reed and Southern Mountain Music on the Mason-Dixon line, and there's a logic here. My goal is for you to hear Ola Bell's past and to hear what she wanted to be her future. To do so, I'm going to play a song that's reminiscent of what Ola Bell likely heard growing up in the southern mountains of North Carolina, and then I'm going to play two different versions of the original composition of Ola Bell, which shaped what she imagined as her musical future. So to begin, I'd like to play The Uncloudy Day, which is the first song on Ola Bell Reed and Southern Mountain Music on the Mason-Dixon line, and it's also the song that Nate just played a few minutes ago. But let's give a listen to this version. from Ola Bell's youth, one could strongly argue that this version of Uncloudy Day is similar to what Ola Bell likely heard growing up in Ash County. Particularly interesting here is her clawhammer banjo style playing, actually it's called a clawhammer shuffle, which was learned directly from her uncle, Oliver Dockery, and was inspired by her father, Arthur Campbell. If we think about Uncloudy Day, we're left with a song that was learned in the Southern Mountains, was turned into a bluegrass gospel number as we just heard from Nate, and then it's turned back into a mountain song by Ola Bell in 1966 as a way to play her past 34 years after leaving North Carolina. What I'd like to do next is to play two versions of I've Endured. This is an original composition by Ola Bell and also one of her most famous songs. She's going to be joined by the musicians you see on screen. This is Burl Kilby on the banjo and also John Miller on guitar. The first version of I've Endured was recorded on April 17, 1966, and the next was recorded just two days later on April 19th, and these are actually the first recordings of Ola Bell's, uh, one of Ola Bell's most famous compositions. So before we begin, I'd like you to pay attention to how Ola Bell sings the melody to the banjo player Burl Kilby during the first instrumental break, and then Burl composes an accompaniment on the spot. I'd like you to listen also to how quickly a burrow picks up on Olivelle singing, and thus a song and an arrangement begin to coalesce. <laughs> you heard Ola Bell's consistently singing the same stanza to Burl, who takes Ola Bell's melody, and by the second instrumental break, an accompaniment begins to form. So keeping this version in mind, let's listen to the second version of I've Endured, and this one will have John Miller playing guitar. <laughs> Yeah. 
In the second version of I've Endured, we hear a solid introduction by Burl Kilby, which is the same accompaniment that he had arranged just two days prior. The song is also transposed down from A major in the first version to F sharp major in the second version, presumably to better fit Ola Bell's vocal range. And then finally, there's a more relaxed tempo with this version, suggesting the musicians and Ola Bell are more comfortable with actually playing this song. So taken together, what we've heard here is Ola Bell developing her desired sound. It was informed by being born in the mountains 50 years ago and aided by the musical talents of Burl Kilby and John Miller. And this sound was how Ola Bell wanted to hear her future, and it's what you can hear on Ola Bell Reed and Southern Mountain Music on the Mason-Dixon line. And with that, I'd like to turn over to Alan Burdett to help us talk a little bit about the uh, archives of traditional music and their role in the project. Good afternoon. Uh, as Doug said, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of the archives of traditional music in this uh, project and this, the product that res resulted. And this is an audience I don't need to convince of the benefits of archives and the importance of archives, but I think it will be useful to, to know a little bit more about how we were involved and in, in what we did. Um, we'll talk about uh, uh, the ways in which the archives of traditional music is serving beyond this product is the repository of record providing both preservation services as well as uh, cataloging services, so long-term access, long-term preservation for the materials. Um, our role in providing transfers of the original recordings and, and the ways in which we were part of a kind of an early public forum for what later became this project. And this isn't the case of recordings that were lost for a long time. Uh, copies, in fact, were uh, living at the Maryland State uh, Arts Council and copies at the Library of Congress. Uh, but the original recordings had been following Henry around for a number of years, uh, along with his documentation, the notes that he took at the time. And it, it really was kind of a like, chance conversations between Nate and Henry, where they discovered that, that uh, Henry had some recordings of Ola Bell Reed, and uh, Nate talked with me, and I talked with Henry, and we thought these, these are recordings of uh, valuable recordings for her legacy, and, uh, and the, that lots of people would be interested in them, and they should come to an archive. And at that time, I didn't realize there were other copies in other places, but it was important, as we all know, for preservation purposes to have to work from those original recordings. And so uh, we began that process of uh, bringing the original recordings into the archives of traditional music. And to give you a little bit of background about uh, the archives of traditional music, for those of you who don't know who we are, uh, we're a, uh, the, the name doesn't quite capture uh, the kinds of things we have. It's, uh, our scope is very broad, but we uh, are centered around the fields of ethnomusicology and folklore and anthropology. Uh, we have significant linguistic holdings. Uh, we have a large early jazz and blues uh, 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 recordings and collections. Uh, a number of oral histories, as well as popular, uh, uh, early popular uh, music from around the world. So our scope is very international um, from this constellation of disciplines. And we have field recordings, which we think of as being the core of what we hold in our archive, but we also have sig significant numbers of commercial rec recordings. Uh, there are about 38,000 uh, 78 RPM discs in our holdings, about 12,000 vinyl LPs. Uh, again, these are uh, from all over the world, as well as some broadcast recordings, uh, things that have been recorded from radio broadcasts, typically outside of the United States in our case. So there are about 3,000 different field collections. Uh, they represent about 40,000 uh, hours of recorded sound altogether, a, a total of about 100,000 recordings. And as I said, they're, they're from all over the world. And we serve a wide public. Uh, we, of course, serve scholars and teachers here at Indiana University and students, uh, but we also 
in, in many ways serve scholars from all over the world, some of whom come to visit us, uh, but others who uh, simply contact us, contact us by email or phone, and we provide copies in the cases where we can uh, uh, for their research projects or in, in cases of uh, the, the Native American holdings we have, uh, providing uh, kind of repatriation services for tribal institutions. We also uh, serve the ethnomusicology program and uh, the folklore program here uh, by training students in archiving and handling archival materials, uh, as well as library science students who work uh, at the Archives of Traditional Music. So as I said, uh, we get uh, collections um, like this, this collection of recordings that uh, Henry Glassy left for us, and that began a, a process uh, like many archives do of understanding what we have, uh, understanding the documentation. Uh, and in this case, uh, it arrived at a time when we were very much uh, working with the, the, what we think of as the, the international crisis in media preservation. And uh, so we were very active in uh, doing some preservation transfer work in the archives at that time, working towards uh, supporting the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative, a facility that uh, you'll have an opportunity to visit tonight. And so we very, in this case, because there was uh, some interest in doing other things with this collection, uh, we very soon after getting the recordings made preservation transfers. And those uh, then formed the basis for some later things that happened uh, both public presentations and then this uh, particular publication. So that was something that we were able to do in very, and because there was a kind of immediate interest in the recordings, uh, we kind of moved ahead of other things that uh, we had been working on, as all our archives do, nibbling away at uh, the holdings, uh, both the preservation and the cataloging. We're going to move this one up and uh, uh, help facilitate uh, this particular project. The, the book and the CDs are a particular kind of product, but uh, like any book or even CD release, they are often a narrow selection of a larger body of materials, and that's uh, the case here as well. It's a, it's a product that curates uh, these holdings much more thoroughly than our catalog records and our materials do, but uh, uh, by the sort of reverse token, there's a broader range of materials that are in the archives than our uh, displayed within the book. And so to facilitate that, we, we catalog our recordings. At the Archives of Traditional Music, we use a standard MARC record format, and so our field collections as well as our commercial recordings are cataloged uh, in a system that is available to anyone around the world who can uh, access it through the IU library system or WorldCat uh, using a very standardized library record. And this is the, the library record for this collection. And as our media uh, preservation efforts progress and our, our access services uh, mature, we'll be able to also to provide uh, the rest of this collection as well as co other collections like it in an online format where legal or ethical uh, conditions allow us to do that. So one of the things that uh, kind of happened as uh, we acquired the collection, and as I mentioned, there was uh, kind of immediate interest, a, a serendipitous uh, coming together of uh, Cliff Murphy's sort of simultaneous interest in the recordings, the copies that he had discovered uh, at the archive in Maryland, as well as the accessioning of the collection here in Indiana. and. Uh, the, I don't remember if Cliff contacted you all or uh, how, how the two pieces came together, but uh, uh, it was shortly after. We, we did a, a public presentation about the collection as a way of highlighting uh, collections here at the archives, and, and uh, something that I've always uh, felt was important to do and would always like to see more of is working with the folks who have collections and deposit them, deposited them and particularly someone like Henry, who uh, can bring a wealth of knowledge about those collections 
and uh, these recordings that he made uh, in, in doing a, a very wonderful public presentation. So this was kind of an early uh, uh, version of talking about these recordings and the, their legacy and their value uh, prior to, I don't think anyone was thinking of a book at that point in time, but this became a, a, an initial kind of thing. So in a, in a way, the, the archive provided a framework for uh, this kind of public presentation and discussion about the materials uh, in a way sort of not unlike uh, Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney said, let's put on a show, and we said, you can use our barn. And so the, the archive kind of played the, the role of providing the barn uh, for this presentation, which then led to uh, further discussions and uh, recognition that there's, there's, uh, this, is a, this is material that has a value beyond just a presentation. Uh, there's a lot more that we can do with this. And so that's what, uh, that's what they did. And so from, from there, from uh, kind of an early hosting and, and providing a context for discussion of the material, pres preserving it and cataloging it, uh, that provided a kind of a launching pad in, in certain respects for what followed. And I think that's a role that, uh, as archives, we, uh, we, we tend to talk a lot about the technical things that concern us, cataloging, preservation, but we also have this role of uh, as a catalyst for curation that perhaps may have very little to do with our own particular input. Uh, the archives had uh, almost nothing to do with the, the curation of this material in the form of a book, um, but uh, we provided a context for some of this to get going. So uh, we're very, very proud and very happy to have uh, played that uh, that particular role in this project, and to be the long-term place for this. As we all know, CDs are a, a format with a limited lifespan, um, and our role is to provide long-term access to these recordings well after the CD is gone, um, and whatever formats that may follow. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you everyone. What an interesting project. Um, there is a few minutes available for questions if anyone would like to ask the panel anything about um, Team Ola Bell. It, it seemed to me that this was really a wonderful, wonderful collaboration among the four of you and the other people that were working with you as well. It sounds like it was very successful and very meaningful. Um, I'm wondering if there were any collaborative challenges that you would like to share that might be helpful to other people who might be thinking of doing a, a broad project like this. It worked perfectly for everybody. <laughs> I, th I, I think uh, we like contradictions and complexities and we like challenges. The fact is nothing could have been easier than the final product of this. I mean, it, was, it wasn't hard in the old days. I met Ola Bell and we were friends in minutes. And uh, I put the tapes away and they were helpful to her when she got her National Heritage Fellowship and that was a good thing and seemed sufficient. And she was very, very happy that they were deposited in the Library of Congress. That seemed to her an important place for her work to be preserved. She didn't live to see them here at Indiana University, but she lived to be quite happy about the whole deal. So there the tapes lay. Cliff Murphy found copies of them. I didn't know that he found copies of them. I didn't even know that he had copies of them. The copies were the copies that I gave Olabel because it seems an ethical responsibility of all of us to provide those things back. So I gave her a copy of every tape that I made and she kept them. And then she bequeathed them to the Maryland State Archives. And so when Cliff came, he's of course a man who loves country music and he's from the North and he's stuck in Maryland and he's got a responsibility to deal with things other than country music. But dealing with country music, he looked around for things that he could latch on to and he found those tapes. They had my name on them, as well as Olabel's name. And it, what he did was begin to look for the people who had carried her tradition forward. That is, he found her son, Dave. He found her nephew, Hugh. Another nephew, Zane. He found other people in that area. It's an amazing thing that right there on the, 
on the Mason-Dixon line, there is an Appalachian community that still self-identifies as Appalachian today, even though none of the people alive today were born in the South. So he found those people, and as he found those people, he began to wonder who in the world I was. He went to the American Folklore Society meeting in Louisville, Kentucky. We hit it off immediately, and he started working on the next generation. I was happy to, to do the project that Alan described, that is, that uh, Doug and I did, did. Nate started the whole thing. Doug and I then put on a little, a little show at the noontime for the Arc of the Traditional Music. Meanwhile, Cliff was invited here to give a lecture to the graduate students at the Folklore and Ethnomusicology Department, and when he came, he'd already begun to think about the possibility of a collaborative project, and he showed up on the very day that we had done that thing. And so there was absolutely no tension at that point. Then we all became friends, and Doug and I and Cliff then did the next, all the next field project together. That is, we interviewed all the other people, we found Burl Kilby. We didn't know that he, we were told that Burl was dead, we were told that Johnny Miller was dead, but the fact is they were still alive for moral historical purpose, that was tremendously important. So we were able, the three of us, to record a whole lot of information that then was essential to the book. I would say, it's a little sad, the only challenge I guess you would say is that we had bad information about the deaths of two of the most important people, Burl who played the banjo and Johnny who played the guitar in the last piece that Doug played for you, but they were alive. Actually, Burl only lasted about three more months, but we did get a good interview with him, and it was possible for his banjo picking to be a, to appear. He's the only person who appears on both of the CDs. He recorded in 1966 and 67 for me, he recorded, and I guess it was for 2013 for Cliff. But I would like to say there were challenges, but what there really was was a kind of glorious serendipity. A person who does a lot of field work like I do realizes there's a, a kind of God that watches over the witless ethnographer and occasionally you feel that a project is blessed and I think that was exactly what I would say of this and I wouldn't necessarily spiritualize that blessing but Dave Reed, Olabel's son, does and believes that his Lord actually stepped down and stepped in. That's his idea, not mine, but nonetheless the project went as easy as though there were a guardian angel over the whole thing. I'd like to talk about challenges. There weren't any. We hit it off. The whole thing worked. I love Dola Bell. I love Cliff. I love Doug. I love Nate. I love Alan. Easy. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> so. Any other comments from the panel? One thing that, that uh, struck me as I was putting together my thoughts for this is that uh, often we get archival collections and you know we sometimes unfortunately we get them well after the person who made them has passed away uh, or we get them without with only the barest of information and in this case you know, Henry had very good notes about these recordings even as a, a young man he was doing very good work in terms of ethnographic field work. I mean, uh, you know, all of us look back at our younger days and like, oh, I could do things much better. But you know, Henry had very good notes, but he didn't. There was no book that went with this. There's, there was a lot of information in your memory, and then it was fleshed out later by this oral history. And I think the really wonderful thing that happened was a book worth of knowledge was created. Uh, out of this that didn't exist before, and if all the pieces hadn't come together, would not have happened, and we would know a lot less about these recordings, about Olabel, about this collection, than if uh, if uh, the guardian angels hadn't been with us, as Henry said. Yeah. Um, is, there, is there a minute more, if not? Sure, there is a minute more. It, it, this wouldn't take very long, but it, this minute is a kind of celebration of the proposition of field work because they, this whole project was a matter of field work, that is, Doug and Cliff and I were doing field work together right up to the present. But it's also true that the lucky break for me, in fact, was that when I met Olabel, I wasn't brand new in the field. I had been so fanatic that I had been out in the field with big old cumbersome recording equipment that is up in the Appalachian region for five years before I met Olabel. 
That is, I started it when I was 19, and what that meant was that I really knew a lot about the music that she was going to play, and that's what immediately caused the connection between us. The connection between us wasn't exactly a personal thing, it got very personal. But the very beginning is that she could talk music, and I could talk music, and she sang a song, and I'd already heard that song. And Furthermore, and most important, was that she came from Ash County, North Carolina, which she told me the very first night that we met. And I knew where, not only did I know where Ash County was, I had already at that time recorded a lot of music in Ash County, not any, by any of her family, and indeed had already published a couple of articles in Ash, Ash County tradition, and so that she saw me as not only a person who knew about Ash County, but it was a person who was at a university, I was a graduate student, who was at a university and who could, uh, in effect, ennoble the tradition that she had already internally ennobled herself. And so there was a, a, a meeting in the air between Olabel and I about how tremendously important that music that she played was. It wasn't just entertainment. It was the precious heritage of a people from the high mountains who had not had much in money, but had had a great deal in culture. And that was how we connected. And so that the fact that more, I guess I'm saying, the more field work you do, the more you understand, the more you understand, the more connections are easy to make. And what happened with me and Olabel was that we connected in the, in, on the reality that we both absolutely loved the music that she loved. OK, thank you. There might be time for one question, if anyone would like to ask anything. Okay, well, let's thank our speakers very, very much.